All right, thank you for that wonderful singing. Uh, it's a, at this time, I'd like, it's my pleasure actually to introduce our next speaker and uh, the Bible Hour speaker for the entire week. My brother-in-law, Mr. Pastor Justin Lynn. And uh, this guy, I tell you what, he is, I, I don't know how he does it. He is, uh, he's very busy. He's got, he does a lot of things. Uh, he's one of the pastors at Menominee Falls Bible Church. Uh, so there's a responsibility there. And of course, he's on staff with the Brean Bible Institute. And I believe you're still doing things with respiratory therapy. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So he, he's got to be a good planner. I don't, I don't know how he does it all, but uh, it's my pleasure to bring him forward with the word. Thank you. Thank you, brother. That's what coffee's for, right? No, no. <laughs> no we don't need that. The Bible hour and a half, right? <laughs> Does anyone not have an outline this morning? If you don't, just raise your hand, and we've got some awesome servants of the Lord back there who can get you a handout. So just toss your hand up if you don't have one. I do encourage you that this as a, as a handout, please use it as a tool. You're fine to throw it out if you want, but... It's something to take home. Lots of scriptures. There's so much more that we won't even be able to dig into together. So this is just to whet your appetite um, with all of that. And I'll just really quickly say at the same time that if, if we were teaching on the family at school, at BBI, you know, we, we have a couple hundred hours, over a hundred hours of lecture that would go into this. I was just talking to Pastor, uh, Pastor Kevin Sadler, and he's like, yeah, you get to develop it all week long. I'm like, yes, that's wonderful, except four days isn't enough to get 100 hours in. So this is just the beginning. And Lord willing, uh, might he soften our hearts to these things. Might he do a work in our hearts, change us. I'll tell you, when I was asked to speak on the family, uh, you, just, you, you almost don't want to take it at first, because any pastor in here, have you ever spoken, any Bible teacher, have you ever spoken about marriage or family before on a Sunday morning? What does the car ride look like on the way to church? What is the week leading up to that? Whenever we're talking on things of the heart and things that touch relationships in our lives all the way through, it just seems like those fiery darts of Satan just uh, go along and uh, but you know what, the Lord uses that if our heart is right. I love that idea of the vertical uh, relationship with God walking in a horizontal world. When we have this going on, we're gonna be talking about that this morning. When we have that connection with the Lord, we receive those darts and we say, okay, Lord, what's going on in my life? What do I need to give you? What stuff do I need to give you? And where do you need to produce your righteousness in me so that I can meet the needs of my children so I can meet the needs of my wife. Ultimately, so I can meet the needs of those smiling faces in the pews at my church who are also struggling, who also got into fights on the way to church that morning. <laughs> that being said, let's pray for a minute. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. Thank you for this opportunity again, Lord. I really am humbled by the opportunity to just open your word so many times this week, Lord. And Father, uh, you know what's going on in each of our hearts and lives. There are struggles that we all have. Father, there's, there's probably what we call pain points, things that hurt that we don't even want to approach, Lord. But Father, we know you are the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies. Father, help us to see these things of you in your word. Father, might we be open to your spirit who convicts us, who leads us, who guides us. Father, who ultimately gives the power to transform our lives. Father, would you do a work in my life? Would you do a work in the life of every listener this morning? Would you transform us so that you can transform our families and our communities around us, Lord? Father, we love you. Thank you for this time. May you be glorified. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So if you saw, uh, you, you see me walk up, if you don't know me, I know many of you do know me, but if you, you see me walk up and you think, who is this kid up here about to talk uh, about the, the family? Now I will say this, that my father-in-law joyfully pointed out to me whenever he saw me, whenever we got here to the conference this week, he said, 
are those gray hairs that I see? I wasn't quick enough in the moment, but I said, yes, I've been married to your daughter for 17 no, years. Maybe I should say, you've been my father-in-law for 17 years. No, no. that's uh, very exciting. I have uh, enjoyed marriage and been blessed to be with my wife for 17 years. We're working on 18 years at the moment. Uh, that's hard to believe because numbers like that don't match this. No, I'm picking. <laughs> and if there's, there's uh, any uh, question about how young or old I look like, I challenge you to put a ball cap on me, and it lowers me down a good 10 or 15 years. <laughs> I look like I'm leaving to Beaver and Jeepers, Dad, can I have a nickel? <laughs> By the way, $5 at the BBI table. <laughs> God has been good to me. Why do I have the privilege to be able to speak about family? Is it because of my age? No. It's got to be because of my background, right? It's got to be there with some amazing godly heritage. You guys know who the Kendricks brothers are? They're the guys behind the movies Courageous and War Room and the Love Dare or something like that. I forget, I forget the names of all, the, all of their movies. They're amazing. Is it because I have a godly heritage like them? I'm sorry to tell you that no, I don't. And in fact, it would be the opposite of that kind of legacy that I am here this morning. I come from a broken home. My mother never married my biological father. I was hidden from that whole side of the family. She got married uh, and uh, that ended in divorce. And then there were a number of other guys and back and forth, a very broken home. By the time I was 18 years old, I had moved 50 times. That's a five and a zero. I would say that's a bit of a picture of instability. Whenever we move, sometimes we forget little things behind, right? We leave little pieces of us. By the time I had moved 50 times, little pieces of me were left all around. I was a very broken, painful person, anger-ridden but you would have never known it. Why? Because on the outside, I have the disposition of the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> that was my nickname in high school, by the way. <laughs> I was broken. I didn't, I knew the Lord. I, got, I trusted Christ as my savior as a nine-year-old, but I didn't really grow up in a, church, uh, a Christian home, church-ish, here and there, Praise the Lord, it was a grace church. Church-ish all along the way, but it was broken. And so many, I didn't know what it meant to be a man. I didn't know what a, a, a father was. Father's a dirty word. I didn't like that. That was painful for me to hear words like that. <clears throat> but God be the glory to him and him alone who faithful men allowed God to work in their lives, men and women, loving the Lord, seeing him work in their lives. They let God work in their lives to the extent that they saw this little Pillsbury Doughboy and said, I bet there's hurt back behind that. And they stepped into my world. They loved me. I'll never forget, they set me down when I was about 17 or 18 years old, and they said, Justin, you have the opportunity change the trajectory of your family. It is only through the grace of God and his people pointing me back to his word and painting a picture for me that I am standing here for you, with you this morning. God used those people, ultimately took me to BBI where these things were coming alive to me. So I want to share with you some of these other things. Why am I here today? Because it is God's grace alone that has transformed me into his son, first and foremost, his man, his husband, and his father. And I happen to be a pastor too. 
If that's not enough, I got this yesterday <laughs> from my children that happens to verify that I am the best dad <laughs> ever. <laughs> so, that's no. <laughs> They don't make these in mass production either. <laughs> it's custom one of a kind stuff. <laughs> kind of look like Mr. T up here. <laughs> All right, you have your outlines with you, right? All right, at the first, there is a question up there, and I want you to do this with me. I want you to picture in your mind's eye with me what does a godly family look like? See, we're, we're all walking into this time this week. Oh, they're talking about family. And in our mind, it automatically means something to us. So I want you to unpack this for a minute on your own. Take a minute. We've got 30 seconds. That's it, because I don't have a Bible hour and a half. So 30 seconds. What does a biblical family look like? What are the hallmarks of a Christian family? Write these down. We'll come back to them later. What are the core characteristics and habits of biblical mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, children? Our hearts and minds can go a hundred different directions when it comes to trying to figure out, well, what is a family? It, you know, it's gotta be those people that they're at the church every time the doors are open. They're the first ones there. They're the last ones to leave. That, that is a biblical family, right? Maybe it's those people you know, like the jeepers, dad, can I have a nickel? Maybe we're going back to the cleavers and we're going back to that, that, that time. And this family never gets in a fight. There's never a disagreement. Or maybe as time progresses in our modern society, maybe it's having the perfectly posed, glossy, filterized images of a family that are perfect for sharing online. We must always first set our sight on the target so that we know what we're aiming for because we're gonna miss it if we don't set our eyes on the target. All right, who here likes the Olympics? Okay, how many people remember the 2004 Olympics? Oh, yeah, no, right? That shows you how how quickly we forget these things. Well, 2004, that's when they they were occurring in Athens, Greece. All right, somebody by the name of Michael Phelps, he was bursting onto the international scene at that time of history. I mean, he's one of the, if not the most decorated swimmer in world history, but with that. But there's another person at the 2004 games that we never hear about. And this guy's name is Matt Emmons. Emmons represented the United States in the three position 50 meter rifle event. Anyone know what that means? He was a marksman. All right, he was, he was, did you know they did that at the Olympics? They do. All right, and he was dominating the competition as he advanced to the final round of the event. His combined score so far was so far ahead of all the other shooters that all this guy had to do was just touch the target. He just had to hit it. I don't mean he had to hit the bullseye. He just had to be on the mark somewhere to achieve victory. A sports writer named Rick Riley said it like this, with one shot to go in Athens, Emmons was on his way to laughter of a win. In fact, all he had to do was hit the target. It'd be like telling Picasso all he had to do was hit the canvas. 
In preparation for the shot, Emmons pressed his cheek against the rifle stock and sighed down the barrel through the scope. Sighted down the barrel through the scope. Sighing wouldn't do a single thing. He took a breath, let it out, and he squeezed the trigger. The sound of the gun firing was unmistakable. What happened next was shocking. Now, when you watch the sport of rifle shooting uh, on television, a monitor focused on the target is always going to be up in the corner of the television screen. And when a competitor takes a shot, that monitor is going to signal as soon as where it hits and, and let you know where the mark was. <clears throat> When Emmons lowered his weapon, he immediately looked to see where his bullet had struck the target. But there was no mark. And there was no score. Confused, he began talking with the judges, indicating he believed he had hit the target. Why was there no score? Eventually, the lead judge picked up a microphone to explain. He announced that Emmons' score was zero because of a cross shot. The crowd gasped. Emmons lowered his head, obviously unable to believe what had happened. A cross shot is when a shooter hits a target that's not the one he was supposed to be shooting at. At some point while going through his pre-shot routine, Matt had zeroed in on the target next to his. His zero score not only lost him the gold medal, he fell out of medal contention completely. Matt Emmons' story provides a great lesson. Always be sure you're aiming at the right target. That's a powerful picture. And I'll, I'll say this. You might be sitting on the later years of your life, looking back at your family, looking back at all that you've gone through, and this might hurt a little bit. You might look at this as we look at God's word and you might think, oh, I was looking at the wrong target. I was shooting at the wrong target. God's grace is in this moment to pick you up, to build you up, to mold you more into Christ and God can redeem the missed target of your life. I was the missed target. And God stepped into my world and changed my life. He can do that in your family. There might be conviction because at the moment you're missing it, you were every which way doing all the things but missing the thing. God's word will guide us this morning. There is hope. And then at the same time, maybe you're gonna be hearing this and you're energized and you're pumped. Praise God. Let's fine tune, brothers and sisters, with what we're doing this morning. <clears throat> Turn with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter one. We are deep Bible students around here. What's the sister epistle to the book of Colossians? Ephesians, yes. Ephesians takes a lot of the same similar content uh, and it expounds it even more. Colossians is like the Cliff's Note version. A lot of people don't even know what that is anymore. It's like the condensed summary version of that. And, and Paul often frames things a little bit differently. So we are going to be looking at Colossians chapter one. But where do we tend to go to for thinking about, you know, where's the go-to place for us to learn about the family? Ephesians chapter five and six. All right, that's where we're going to learn about the family. Now, I wanna lay a, a little bit of a, of a groundwork with that, that Paul doesn't specifically talk about parenting until chapter six, verse four, where he gives the admonishment to fathers. Leading up to that, he talks about husbands and wives. And before he talks about husbands and wives, do you know what he talks about in chapter four, verse one? He says, hey, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Be a holy, godly person. Why? because of all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Ephesians chapter one. 
because of what Jesus Christ has done. Chapter two, because we've been made alive and God is working together. He is working through the body of Christ despite nationality. This is what we understand when we see the clarity of mid-Acts dispensation. When God started working through the apostle Paul, we get clarity to all of these things. God's word starts to fit together and just make sense. Praise God for that. But Paul doesn't stop with it just making sense. Paul gets on his knees in Ephesians chapter three. Fun fact, trivia, my favorite prayer of Paul, Ephesians chapter three. Love it. I could preach this whole sermon on that and tie it to the family because it's amazing. But in that prayer, Paul is praying that, that God will go deeper into you. That God's grace, everything we understand about grace and that we've, we've been looking at all the different shades of meaning and what does that mean? Well, how does that fit in as we're going through the book of Acts? All of those things come together and come to life in our walk, in our trust with Jesus Christ in our life. And that's Ephesians chapter three. And then he starts in chapter four. So what? walk a holy life, live a holy life, and that's going to work out as husband and wife. And then finally, once that, we get that taken care of, then in chapter six, we finally start talking about parenting. So our outline this week, as we kind of walk through all these different sessions, you know, we're not even going to start talking about parenting until Wednesday. I'm sorry. Why? Because first things first, because Paul didn't start talking about parenting till all those other things were in place. And we've got to take the time. We've got to build the foundation. And we know that the foundation is Jesus Christ alone according to God's word. We're in the book of Colossians now, in Colossians chapter one, and we're gonna make a couple points. Number one on your outline, you can follow along with me. We're not putting the, the answers up here for you. I will try to be articulate for you. And in the case that I'm not, ask my wife, I do have a history of being inarticulate. There, are, there is an answer key back by the, uh, the tripod with no camera on it. All right, so there is a, a tripod back there. Answer key is there if you happen to miss anything. Um, the first thing that we want to point out on this journey towards targeting, you know, the godly family that we all like is this. Grace-filled homes result from grace-filled individuals. It's simple but it's profound, it's deep, and we can't get one without the other. I can't have a dozen donuts without 12 individual donuts. If I want this collective unit of my home, of my family, to be godly, to be gracious and grace-filled, exalting to the Lord, it's gotta take place here first. It's got to take place with your spouse first in that marriage relationship, and then it blesses the children beyond that if God has blessed your home with children in your home. Grace-filled homes result from grace-filled individuals. First, let's define some things, all right? Grace-filled homes. What do I mean by that? Well, grace-filled homes indicate families which are, and we have three things that we're gonna look at, and we're gonna walk through Colossians chapter one, the end of it, that we will see. Look with me in Colossians chapter one, verse 24. Paul says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you in order to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. The apostle Paul 
is talking about what God had given him specifically, uniquely, the message of his grace. And Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter three, also mentions that this message that Paul had, it was hidden, it was unsearchable. You can't go back to the Old Testament and discern and find all of these things. Why? It was hidden in the mind of God from the foundation of the world until the time was right and he revealed it to the apostle Paul. And that is what we're given a Polaroid snapshot in Colossians chapter one uh, in verse 24. He said, this stuff, what God is doing, the grace of God that is being unleashed on the world freely to simply be received by faith through trust in Jesus Christ, that was given to Paul. And this message, what did it do? 25, at the end of it says, which was given to me for you all in order to fulfill the word of God. That means to bring to completion, to perfect it, to finish it up. After the goodness and grace of God revealed to the apostle Paul, it finished this book for us. It filled it full. There was nothing more to be said because God's plan for the heavens and the earth have been revealed for all to enjoy. This stewardship, this dispensation was given to the apostle Paul. He then describes it a little bit differently in verse 26. He says, the mystery which was, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now, those are our favorite words, right? But now, Take that in my life. I was broken. I was hurting and I was lost. But now, that is the picture of grace in our lives. Now it has been revealed. All of these things help us to see Paul was locked in on the word of God. If you're filling in your outline, a grace-filled home is this, first and foremost, it is word-rooted. You cannot grow apart from the vine, so to speak, without being tapped in to the roots. That's what nourishes it. This is our standard. These are our instructions. Word-rooted. And he's saying so much so that the message given to the Apostle Paul, it finished this book. It brought it to completion. And we have that. And so we get to look at, we enjoy it, but we must be rooted in that. And Paul is uh, giving us that by example. You could look over to verses nine and 10 where Paul's talking about us being filled with the knowledge of his will Later on, he talks about increasing in the knowledge of God. Where do we find these things? We find them here. He's given them to us. A grace-filled home must first and foremost be word-rooted. But Paul doesn't stop there. In the words of the infamous infomercial, but wait, there's more. Verse 27, to them, meaning the saints, God willed to make known what are the riches of this glory uh, of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul answers the question of so what? You understand how your Bible fits together. You understand what God is doing today. So what? What's the result? It's Christ literally in you. That is the, the, the same awe impact that we had yesterday with Pastor Kevin telling us that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in us. The Lord of glory who gave himself for me dwells in me. It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we love it and, and the, it's the glory of the mystery because it points to Jesus Christ. And then look at what he says, uh, uh, moving from 27 to 28. He says, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in 
Christ Jesus. Did Paul teach the mystery? Yes. Did he teach what right division is? Yes, he exposes and he explains and he uses that terminology, uniquely so. He uses those words. He lived them out. He embodied them. He kind, he didn't make them up, but he, he, God revealed them through the apostle Paul. And he labored on behalf of everybody. But he doesn't say the mystery we preach. We do preach the mystery. I'm not saying we don't. But what does Paul capture here? He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach. I tell you this. I do not preach a what. I preach a who. I preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery given to the Apostle Paul. But I preach Christ. A grace-filled home is rooted in the word of God. It is Christ exalting. So many more places we can look for that. When your eyes start to open to it, you just see it everywhere. I'm going to challenge you. These three things, these three things that I'm pointing out here, read through these books on your own. Look for word rooted, Christ exalted. We're about to look here. Three, spirit dependent. Spirit dependent. Paul said, verse 28, him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says this, to this end, I also labor. Paul was out there working. But was Paul working it on his own? No, he had people with him. That's not, that's, that's not it alone. He did have people with him. That is God's methodology. We're not lone, lone rangers out there serving the Lord. He's given us the body to equip one another. But he said this, I also labor striving according to what? His working. Was that in your Bible yesterday? Striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. The power of God, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, dwells in me, and it is that power that energizes and effectualizes all that I have, all that I am, and it changes us fundamentally from the inside out. Paul uses the word in Romans chapter 12. He says that it transforms us. God's grace transforms us. He uses his word. He, it exalts Jesus Christ. And number three on that outline, we must be spirit dependent. Why? How many people here are married? Is it hard? <laughs> Next question, how many people here are parents? Is it hard? (laughs) Ah, Yeah, right? We can't do it on our own. Just like our salvation, we couldn't do it on our own. We cannot earn our own righteousness uh, without Jesus Christ. We cannot fulfill God's plans for our homes without Jesus Christ. Why? Because God's plans for our home is Jesus Christ. It's him being formed in me and I bless my spouse. Or if I don't have a spouse, it's just God blessing me, blessing others through me because Christ is being formed in me. But as God does bless and he brings a spouse into your life, that vertical relationship allows you to join in union with your spouse and bless them because of the grace of God and the power of God working in and through you. You cannot do that alone. The world tries. It ends in 50% divorce minimum. Those that don't, don't end in divorce ends in pain, isolation, destruction. You cannot have a healthy marriage without the Lord Jesus Christ. You could have maybe an externally functional 
one, but God's plans for marriage are for a man and woman to live in union with him so that they might live in union with one another. This is, the, this is what we're targeting, folks, this level. I wanna just, I'm, I, I wanna share something that's very personal to me, um, and, I, and I'm gonna say this very gingerly, and I'm not saying it out of attack or uh, any mal anything. <laughs> Don't have the words for it. I am technically, if you count your generations right, I could be a fourth generation grace believer. I take that down, it goes back to my great grandparents. But my great grandparents and my grandparents kind of came together at the same time. So for ease, I'm gonna say I'm a third generation grace believer. But here's the thing. I don't like saying that I'm a third generation grace believer because there is a difference between the grace of God and just understanding the dispensation of the grace of God. You see, those generations before me, they could probably write out a chart better maybe than I could. They could share God's plans according to the ages. They knew what God was doing and they get and praise God and it, that's exciting and it is because without that, we have no confidence in the word of God. And if I don't have confidence in the word of God, I don't have confidence in God himself. Again, word rooted every step of the way. But God's grace in that generation what they were learning about God, what they knew of God, it never went from here to here. My grandfather was an angry, abusive, violent, adulterous man who lived in adultery for years and eventually walked out on his family of seven. But they were at the church every time the doors were open the Grace Church, every time the doors were open. From that, almost every single one of those children do not walk with the Lord. I question if some of them have ever trusted Jesus Christ as their savior. They are broken, they've lived lives of addiction, ruin, they're not functioning healthy members of society. That, is, that hurts, and that is hard to recognize. <clears throat> they understood how the Bible fit together, but they did not know how the Bible fit into them. They may have known about the grace of God on paper, but they didn't know the grace of God in person. <clears throat> I am not casting stones at at, at that generation because I don't know what they were walking through. I don't know. I know their lives were hard. I know they were given much brokenness in their life and God's grace wasn't given the opportunity to flourish in their hearts. But when the challenge was given to me that I can break the cycle, break those chains of abuse that lived in my family for generations in the context of something we all love. In all humility, in all sincerity, I pray that that will never be said of our generations and the generations to come from us. I don't believe it will as we turn our hearts to Christ and we allow him to work in our lives. We see the programs of God and we let him do a program in our lives and we take it from head knowledge to heart knowledge and we live it out, a living faith because this is what the grace of God does in our lives. To the praise of the glory of God, but now. 
So grace-filled homes result from grace-filled individuals. We've been talking about that. We see what it means to be grace-filled, and it takes God doing that work in our hearts. The next thing I want to point out here is that grace-filled families have godly individuals leading them. Godly individuals leading them. Without leadership, we're, we're just wandering, wandering around out in the desert, nowhere to go, aimlessly. We will not hit the target. Anybody, any, any archers here? All right, right? You pull back. I see Pastor Jeff. All right. I think from playing on the Wii, <laughs> I think you pull back and I think... Don't you use like this finger or hand to kind of guide? I'm going to say that's what you do. So you use it to guide. And it's going to go off. It takes leadership. It takes guidance. Men, good morning. God is calling us to step up and be his men. Be the husbands that as Christ loved the church, we are to love our wives. And likewise, we love our families. We love our children. We protect them. We lead them. We guide them. We lavish grace upon them. Ladies, you lead too. Under the guidance and the authority of your husband, you submit your life to Jesus Christ. And God has given you the blessing to love on your children, to love your husband, and build him up as he leads the home. I'm getting ahead of myself. But it takes godly leadership to be able to have this grace-filled home. Ken Ham answers in Genesis, wonderful guy. He has a, written a book called Will They Stand? Talking about generations being passed on from faith to faith. And he loves to point this out. He says, what you do at the top filters down. Ideally, it brings others up. What you do at the top filters down and it brings others up. There's two options for top-down parenting and see which one you might resonate more with or have had some experiences, maybe on the giving end, maybe on the receiving end. There was a husband and wife talking on the phone, uh, the, or the husband was rather talking on the phone with his parents, and, and he goes, well, hold on a minute, and he hushes the phone. Notice I'm making a phone like this, not like this. But uh, he's talking on the phone. He covers over the mouthpiece of it. And he goes, uh, honey, uh, dad said that we can go to their house for Thanksgiving. Or they can cut us out of the will. He says, it's our choice, though. <laughs> it's one option. Of, uh, that guy's leading. Or there could be an example where there was a young child who was a hot day and, and he was given permission to run out and play in the lake. And so he ran out of the house and mom's inside doing dishes, looking out. And that little boy just jumped in the water before he was even, he didn't even scout anything out. He was in barreling forward towards the middle of the lake because that's where it's nice and cool, right? Mom saw it happening from a distance out in the middle of the lake, working its way towards the shore was a big fat gator. And so immediately mom saw what was happening and she calls out and says, son, come back. And the boy did a U-turn. But at that point, it was too late. The gator did get that son and it clapped onto that child's legs and mauled it. But at that time, the mom came out and she grabbed his arms and it was literally tug of war between this alligator and the mom. That gator was strong, but mom was much too passionate to let go. Later on, a farmer is passing by. He sees the struggle, gets out, shoots the gator. Child was saved from it, was in the hospital for weeks. Nasty, severe scars riddled, riddled this child's legs. But mom, because she was fighting so hard, left deep scars from her nails in the child's arms. Later on, a reporter asked to see the scars and, and the kid's proudly showing off his scars because why not? I mean, what kid doesn't? And he goes, but wait, look at my arms too. 
I have them because my mom would not let go. There's two kinds of top-down parenting. There was the controlling, demeaning type of that, but then there was the passionate, protective, life-giving protection of leading through that. Would you look with me? We are going to be looking at various passages, even in the Old Testament, even in the Gospels, because Paul tells me in the book of Romans that these things were written for my learning, okay? The book of Luke chapter six. We're gonna capture a really good principle. Luke chapter six. Christ is dealing with religious leaders. We're kind of a pain in the neck, aren't we? Religious leaders, man, they, they were giving Christ a run for his money and they are trying to trip him up, always. In verse 39 of Luke chapter six, Christ spoke a parable to them saying, well, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? Wow, those words hurt, right? Can, can the blind lead the blind? Ish. It's not going to end well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, meet ditch, meet twisted angle. It's not going to go well. And then Christ elaborates on this idea of without a leader, you, you're, you're going to end up where your leader takes you. Verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained, that means equipped to the level of fully functioning, Everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. There is a principle here for us. <clears throat> this is, uh, colloquially, we might say it this way. You cannot give what you do not have yourself. Some of you I love dearly. Some of you I like. No, I'm picking I appreciate you all, and I can't wait to talk to all of you about these things and just what God's doing in your life. If I had a million dollars for each of you, it's yours. I like you that much. Yes. <laughs> Disclosure, I can't give you a million dollars because I don't have a million dollars. <laughs> and I cannot give it if I do not have it. I cannot... I, I will not have a gracious family. I will not have a life-giving home if I don't have the life of Christ running in my heart, running in my life. Our children will never go further, say for the grace of God, but our children will tend not to go further than where we've brought them. If I live a dejected, cold life apart from the life of God, or if I live a legalistic, self-ruled life, I can't give the Spirit of God to my child. I can't lead them and, and, and demonstrate what it's like to be Spirit-led because I ain't doing it. I'm doing it myself. That's the self-willed. I cannot give what I do not have. This is why we start day one. We wanna have godly families. I'm sorry. Today is about us getting on our knees. It's about God doing a work in all of our hearts to help us grow and what he is doing in our lives because God will reach our children through us. God will reach them through us. There's a passage there in Malachi chapter two. I don't have time. I love the book of Malachi. I want you to go read, read all of chapter two. Again, just like what we read in Luke, he's addressing the spiritual leaders who missed the bus. The bus went by and they didn't get on because they missed what God was doing. They were lacking faith in the Lord. They were not seeing what he was doing. They were not even following his truth. They were not following his uh, commandments. If we take that back to word-centered, these guys had dropped the ball and they were the very keepers of the word of God. And these priests 
had missed the ball when we're reading that. But God says something as he's, he's using this illustration, as he often did with Israel, of husband and wife. And he said, but, but why did he make them one? He said this, because God seeks godly offspring. We're talking about all this stuff here because I cannot have godly offspring without the godly first. So this is where we begin. Point two on your outlines. We see, we lay the foundation for all of this, so this will move somewhat quickly for us. Grace-filled individuals have transformed hearts. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. We're getting God's grace deep into our lives. It's doing something. It transforms us. Now, I told you a little bit about my childhood, right? Those are heavy things. Along the ways, I had picked up some heavy burdens, some heavy rocks, some arrows had been thrown my way, a lot of heavy stuff. You know what the world calls these things? Baggage. Have you ever carried a heavy bag around before? Care about tr- carry a kid? My goodness, they get so heavy. All right? It might not feel bad now, but talk to me in two hours. And my back is broken. See, we all have this baggage of stuff that's going on. And we wear it on our backs, and it's a burden. It's heavy. But we don't just wear it on our backs. Do you know where we wear our baggage? Santa Claus style. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Our stuff that we have, those those fiery darts of Satan that he throws out. Because we live in a sin-cursed world and maybe mom and dad were not walking with the Lord, the light of Christ was not in my home, much damage, much hurt was inflicted and I carry that. I carry the weight on my shoulders but I also carry it right here and this is functionally where it makes a difference because in marriage, it's not just me. Guess what? My wife also has one. Hers is pink, but she has one. And so when I come in to give her a hug, how's that work? Not very good. And you know what? This is filled with toxic stuff. The results of sin, disbelief, pain, anger, bitterness. I keep it right in here basic laws of physics say that it's, it's got to go somewhere. If I push on this and, it, and, and it, it's got to go somewhere, it's going to go, boop, it's going to come right out. So all that trash that I'm holding on me, someone comes along and maybe, I'm going to flip this around, maybe I'm having a bad day and I take dagger, and I throw it into my wife. And because my wife has her pink backpack on, it forces it up out of her, and she retaliates. And then we go, it's like sumo wrestling, right? We're just back and forth, hitting one another with this garbage. God has to transform us. God takes this away. He nailed it to his cross. Jesus Christ has taken the load, the guilt, the shame, the burden, the insecurity that was Justin Lin. And he nailed it to his cross. But I am alive with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. That is a transformed life. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. This is kind of our hallmark verse for the day. But Ephesians chapter four, verse 29 says this, let no corrupt word 
You mean that stuff that when my wife hits me or we belly bump? That stuff that comes out? Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart, what? Oh, it's our word, isn't it? That it might impart grace to the hearers. We're in that section of the book of Ephesians where God is calling us to holy, righteous living as individuals. And again, you gotta be a godly individual before you become a godly spouse. So he's dealing with us here. And he says, let no corrupt word, nothing, but it's grace that is to be coming out. Why is this such a hard thing? Because we have to understand this transdispensational, this interdispensational principle. That what starts from our mouth, what comes out of our mouth, where does it start? It starts in the heart. You have written there for you, don't turn there, but Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. Christ says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And they defile a man. Yes, we can talk about depravity with all of that, but I'm talking about practical depravity right here. God's got to do a work in my heart so that these commands, these principles, and God commands it, Paul says it, so I've got to be able to do it. The resources are there for me to walk in the commands that God has given me. It has to be a work of God where God transforms us. He gets rid of our stuff. And I'll tell you this, God can only get rid of our stuff if we give it to him. He gives us the ability to exercise free will and faith at that. God's grace must reach the heart level. Point number two A, God's grace must reach the heart level. From there we see that God's grace yields a transforming message of life. Have you ever noticed that there is a grand theme, I'm talking big old paintbrush, that Paul paints throughout all of his, hip, his epistles about life? that the power of Jesus Christ, which rose us from death to life. Read Ephesians chapter two and look for death to life and your eyes will boom, wake up. God's grace pours life into us. When we couple that with passages like the Proverbs, where Proverbs chapter four says, tend to your heart because from it, spring the issues of life. What's going on here has everything to do with out here. It gets even harder, this Ephesians 4.29 sort of thing, when we look at Proverbs chapter 18.21, that says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We gotta get God's grace here because it impacts what's coming out of our mouth. It impacts how I treat my wife. It impacts how I treat and handle my children. It impacts how I treat the people of my church, my local body, everyone I talk to. I've gotta get God's grace here because without it, I have nothing to give. I have nothing to give but my own sinful flesh. And you know what I'm really good at doing in my own strength and power? Speaking messages of death, condemnation, pain. My wife forgets to do something. My child disobeys my flesh too easily. Look at what you've done. How could you do that? Those are little arrows. Not pointing to the life of God. We're going to talk about that because we all mess up and there is God's grace for us when our flesh victors because the ultimate victory is in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I want to talk about this really quickly, this quote by General Douglas MacArthur. You know who he was? Important guy. By profession, I am a soldier and take pride in that fact, but I am prouder 
infinitely prouder to be a father. A soldier destroys in order to build. The father only builds, never destroys. The one has the potentiality of death. The other embodies creation and life. And while the hordes of death are mighty, the battalions of life are mightier still. Transformed hearts, a message of life. Last point, grace-filled hearts overflow God's life-giving grace to others. That's God's design. He does it here, and my cup is filling so much that it's just, it's just overflowing. And everyone else is like, ooh, ooh, I want some of that. Gimme, gimme. You, he's not wearing a backpack. I want some of that. God's plan is to reach the world through grace-filled relationships. The reference I have there for you is from Matthew chapter 22. And that's where Christ says, hey, oh, they're trying to trick Christ again, those religious leaders. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God. And then what's he say? Love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor is not Joe across the street. You know who your closest neighbor is? It's your spouse sleeping in that bed beside you. It's your kids down the hall. That is your neighbor. It goes beyond there. God's plan is to reach the world through grace-filled community. As we have families of godly individuals and mom and dads pouring into their children, and they collect because God has called us to assemble together, the local church, Paul supports it, uh, everywhere. And so as a family, we gather in our local church and we're growing in godliness and we're spurring on another family in our church to grow in godliness and God's grace is filling them and they're working. And now all of a sudden we're encouraging one another because each family is just overflowing and backpacks are being flung off. And then those unsaved heathen the people that look just like us and do the same things that we do naturally on our own. They see that. And there's the opportunity for them to be brought into the family of God because God's grace transformed our lives. On the back of your paper, there are three lines. One, two, three. On the big outline, we have grace-filled homes result from grace-filled Individuals. I want you to underline one, write individuals. Follow that same procedure for two and three. So the main idea of point two, right under, um, under point two. And I'll give you a hint. I forgot the commas. So it's gonna go one comma, two comma, three. Under blank one, we have the word individuals. Blank two, transformed. Blank three, what is it? Overflow. What is the heart of a godly family? We started with the question, what does a biblical family look like? What does a godly home look like? It looks like this. Individuals transformed, overflow. That is a biblical family. God, as individuals working in our lives, he transforms us. It overflows to the praise and the glory of God himself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for redeeming my story. Father, continue to write your life, your grace in my heart, my wife's heart, my family's heart. Lord, I pray for all those who are struggling, all those who are encouraged in these very moments. Father, might they take the questions and the, the tools that are on their handouts and use them to allow you to work a mighty work in their lives. In Christ's name I pray, amen.